I feel very privileged to be able to speak here. I'm not a security researcher. Um, I'm working at the um, University of Technology in Vienna. Most of the thing I'm doing is I'm working on user interface design, game design, experience design, stuff like that. And I'm giving a first semester course that introduces people to all kinds of aspects of technology in respect to society, like copyright and privacy, security, and stuff like that. And doing, doing that, I stumbled over that e-voting thing and I looked at it through the eyes of an uh, interface designer and um, experience designer and technology designer and also as a computer scientist, which is my background. And I found a number of aspects that were quite interesting and, and that I didn't found discussed widely. So there's the subtitle of various aspects of a quite complicated discussion because I think that what happened in the last couple of years in the field of e-voting has complicated the discussion consider considerably. Um, this, will be pro this will probably be a controversial talk, so um, we, I hope we can have a lot of discussion afterwards and I hope you don't um, get your eggs and throw them at me or something like that. So, my name is Peter Pogathofer. I'm from the Design and Assessment of Technology Institute at the Faculty of Informatics at Vienna University of Technology. And I'm going to talk about democratic elections and it's, and it's a good starting point to remind ourselves that democratic elections are, um, have two basic um, principles, that is they are free and fair. So what that means is basically that the voter can cast a ballot by themselves secretly and free of influence and stuff like that. In Europe this is also turned around and it said that you not only have the right to do so, we, we should take care that you do so. So we, we, we try to hinder you to sell your vote for example. Um, you, the voter should be free of leverage in active voting as well as in passive voting rights. Um, the same number of equally weighted votes for each voter. And the transparency of the election day procedures achieve the setup and the counting and stuff like that. So this is what is, what is packed into the free and fair um, properties of democratic elections. Um, also it's interesting to see democratic elections as a single point of failure in a democracy. So it's the subsystem of democracy. If this subsystem fails, the whole of democracy fails. You can make a democracy fail by forging elections, by um, making election fraud happen. So I'm going to talk about e-voting. There's a number of um, things that are associated with e-voting like web polls, or internet elections, online voting. Uh, the people in Estonia do that. They're really brave. Um, you can ask me afterwards what I think of them um, otherwise. Um, especially in the light of the recent denial of service attacks that happened in Estonia, which put that in a new light for me. Um, electronic voting machines, there are online electronic voting machines, offline electronic voting machines, and of course electronic ballot systems in rooms like that or in the parliament where people press a button and it's collected automatically. Then there's the aspect of something like networked polling stations. And I'm, I'm only going to talk about this one aspect, the electronic voting machines, because this is the one aspect that is um, in the discussion at most, uh, mostly in the discussion at the moment. And also this is what it seems um, there's a dis political discussion, discussion in Austria whether we should get voting machines, electronic voting. Um, they even discuss about internet elections. Okay, so electronic voting machines. This is a wonderful example. I wouldn't trust this machine too much personally. Win vote, it says, so it probably runs under Windows, so, but that's just um, a starter. A starter. So um, electronic voting machines are known or have made themselves known recently in the last couple of years because of many technical problems, because of, especially in this case, the political entanglements. And um, they have spawned a number of conspiracy theories. Um, so the, there was much attention on the debug machine, so we'll concentrate for the technical aspects, um, maybe on, on debug machines, but also on other samples. Um, there, in the discussion about electronic voting, of course you have pro-arguments and contra-arguments. So the people who are for electronic voting, they say you know, we, we want to see the higher voter partic participation. Electronic voting is cheaper, you have the results faster. The moment you class, close the last polling station, you have the results of the whole election. You have no manual counting errors. As we know, manually counting the votes introduces a certain rate of error, human error. You have simple access. 
um, to the voting machines, it's potentially more accessible. You can, of course, build voting stations that are highly accessible for all kind of challenged or disabled people. They say you have no more invalid votes, which is an, a really interesting argument. Of course, you can build electronic voting in a way so that you cannot cast um, invalid votes. But the problem is, is, the right, is, is it a right to, to cast an invalid vote? But that's a different discussion. And, and this is a, especially an interesting point. Um, of course, there are new possibilities. There are people dreaming of um, dissipating information about ongoing elections during the ongoing election. So then you have the arguments against e-voting. There's, of course, the insecurity of technology and the human nature um, as uh, counter-arguments. You have a loss of transparency and exposure of the secrecy. Um, you have new possibilities for manipulation through the use of a technology that is uh, manipulatable. Is that a word? I don't know. And um, to, to contrast the cheaper argument, um, the uh, argument against e-voting is that it's more expensive. And I basically will look at two arguments from each side. And let's start with the argument that it's cheaper. Um, now that's an argument that you heard a lot about four or five years ago. Since then there have been a number of um, trial runs for electronic uh, voting in European countries, of course in the US. And there are a number of results. So one is in Canada, the Chief, the chief electoral officer um, came to the conclusion that electronic voting costs as much as 25% more than regular voting. Uh, what is interesting here is that um, they um, uh, uh, set an e-voting moratorium that will re remain in place indefinitely because of the problems they had with electronic votings. Um, and uh, Marcel Blanchard said that um, electronic voting machines do not offer sufficient guarantees of transparency and security to ensure the integrity of the vote. That's, that's another part. What is interesting here is that in a very large um, example, they came to the conclusion that it's actually more expensive. And that's not just for one election. Um, what is very interesting is um, there, there are um, um, estimates that it's actually three times the cost per ballot from, uh, for electronic voting. And that's an organization that is not against electronic voting itself, they're for, an, for an clear ethics for electronic voting. Um, but there is another aspect of being cheaper or more expensive, and that is um, what happened in, in the Netherlands recently following a report from an incident, uh, independent fact-finding commission on the reform of the election procedures, the Dutch government has decided to rework the regulation on which the license for a special kind of uh, voting machines, the NEDA working machine, was based. As an immediate measure, the license was revoked. 8,290 machines bought cannot be used anymore. So this is money that flew out the window and is not going to come back anymore. So there is an aspect in e-voting that makes it uh, very expensive right now, and that is we don't have the infrastructure, we have to set it up, and there's a lot of error to happen. There's a lot of things that we're going to throw away again um, until we find a way to do it, if there is one. So let's look at another aspect, the insecurity of technology. Of course, this is probably the most interesting aspect here, but it's also the aspect which I'm I'm most reluctant to discuss because you have way more uh, idea about what I'm talking here. Okay, so the default machines um, are, for example, have been banned in California because the security was so bad. And one of the reasons why the security was so bad is because you can open them with a hotel minibar key. So that's uh, Boing Boing posted this, um, can be opened with a hotel minibar key. Um, and actually, you can see that. You go to the Debolt uh, webpage and you find um, the Acubot TS and the keys which, with which you can open them. And the funny thing is, on this uh, website, you can actually see the profile of the key. So you can use that to du duplicate that key. And you can buy the uncut key. Now, uh, today it looks like that. They changed that. Um, and you can buy the uncut key. Um, from like office furniture supply stores and stuff like that. So you, can, you have the key to open the machine. Now, the question is, if you open the machine, the hardware, does this, um, uh, uh, is this an, a security risk? As you probably know, the source code for these particular machines leaked into the internet, which is a very interesting fact. And it was analyzed by A.V. Rubin and his students and a couple of other people. 
And um, they, they showed that this voting system is far below even the most minimal security standards applicable in other contexts, like for e.g. E e gambling. So they found, for example, a line like that. Define this key, this and the key. And the interesting thing is not only that the key is defined in the source code, which is, of course, a fallacy, but also that they use DES, DES. And DES is, is cracked, I don't know, 10 years now, and this is younger. So this is really ridiculous what is happening here. That's a voting machine. That's a machine for a process that is a single point of failure in our democracy, and they do stuff like that. But more. They didn't even use that key to password protect anything. So they hadn't password protected the vote database file or secured the audit log. So anyone with access uh, during an election could change votes and alter the logs to erase the evidence. So this machine provided the possibility to fix the election and erase all traces on the way. So afterwards, you have a fixed election and no way to prove that anything went wrong. So we could imagine building something like that, a vote stealing control panel on the machine, and when nobody looks, we call it up and we fix the election in, in up front. So we will have 90% um, votes for, no, that's votes so far, and we can just set the slider to the number of votes anyone should have. And the interesting thing is, this is not um, a fictional thing. This actually was done by um, a couple of people. Um, Ed Felton and his colleagues built this software, and you can, you can look it up in a movie, um, a security analysis of an electronic voting machine. You can find it on IT Policy, Princeton, Edo. Um, and the interesting thing is that it really works. So you can do the, the software, you can spread it from one machine to another, exploiting the upgrade uh, mechanism that the, the machine has. So you come, um, there's a card that uh, updates the machine to the newest software, and the, the malware just places itself on this card and it gets taken from one machine to the next. Um, that's what they also showed. But also you can fool the machine in a way so that all self-test runs are um, positive. The trial election that you stage works out like you planned. And if you start the real election, then a malware comes in, fixes the election, changes the result, and then vanishes again without any trace. It deletes itself. And because it can fix the log files, it doesn't leave any traces. You can find more information about exploits of voting machines in a movie that is quite recent, Hacking Democracy. You can see it on Google Video, inter interestingly enough, in the full version, um, where they show how to fix um, one of these scanner systems, where you actually fill out a paper ballot and you scan it with a machine, and the results are fixed. We have another example in Europe, the NetApp machine. This is the NetApp machine. Not all people in the Netherlands dress like the cowboy over there. Um, the NetApp machine was um, infamous for a number of hacks that were um, uh, done with it. Um, hackers said they could play chess on it, and the company maintained that it was a special purpose machine. Um, that you couldn't do anything other than use it as a voting machine. It's not a general purpose computer. It's a special purpose machine. Everything is fixed in there. You cannot change the software. So the uh, Jan Grunendahl, the, the um, head of the company of NetApp, said, I would like to witness a proof for the assertion that it's possible to play chess with our voting machines. And this is what they did. They showed him how to play chess on the voting machines. They still have one. They bought it from a community where they didn't want to use it anymore because it was insecure. Um, And there was another uh, thing that happened, so that, that was the, the statement from Jan Grönendahl again. Moreover, we explicitly paid attention to the goal that the voting machines work standalone. That is to say that there is no connection with the network, so that an interference from the outside is impossible. What more could you do, is what he's saying. We make the machine totally standalone. There are no interfaces to the outside. You cannot interfere. You cannot listen. You cannot do anything. Hackers don't stand a chance. That's an interesting sentence, because I believe that you, shouldn't, you should never say that. That's a pure provocation. So that's what they did. Let's just look at the movie. It doesn't need any sound. They have their um, NetApp machine, which also can play chess. At that time, 90% of all votes in, in the Netherlands were cast on that machines. You press the button and you press the vote button. 
And of course it leaks something. It leaks a radio signal that you can receive with a scanner. And if you evaluate it properly, you can write a little piece of software that shows you what is being voted at the moment. Out the window goes the secrecy of the ballot. So here's a more or less proof, how, how, however possible it is to prove something in a video. Okay, so it works not only besides the machine, it works 25 meters, 70 feet away. So you can stand outside the, the room where the polling station is and just record everything that um, happens in there and correlate it with the people that walk in and out. And you have broken the secrecy of the ballot. Wonderful. We have an example from Germany. They also used the, the native machines. The voting computers were delivered ahead of the arrival, er, arrival of the Electoral Commission and were standing unguarded in the freely accessible polling station, at most guarded by the school janitor. What a qualified person to do that. They were secured, they, they were secured by means of simple lead seals, you know, these little one centimeter diameter things that can be forged and manipulated with little effort. So this is the report of a Chaos Computer Club um, uh, election observer group that um, uh, worked at a mayor, Lord Mayor election in Cottbus. Um, this is of course not a single case. We, that's a very famous case from Ed Feldner. I was going about my business this morning when I was surprised to see some unattended electronic voting machines that had already been delivered to a polling place in advance. I wasn't looking for voting machines, not knowing that it served as a polling place, but the machines were pretty hard to miss. And to prove it, he took a picture of himself with the voting machines, unattended, unguarded, if he was a malicious hacker, he could have had enough time, more than enough time, to rig the election, to fix anything, to do what he ever wanted. Now, we've moved from purely technical problems to the human side of the problem that there is always another problem with um, security and that is people are responsible for it. The interesting thing is that in a couple of thousand years of uh, civilization we've learned to cope with human error, but we've not yet learned to cope with uh, machine insecurity coupled with human error. So that's a problem that is um, very, very um, dangerous. As Bruce Schneier says, amateurs tend to attack machines, professionals target people. Okay, a third point is that they promise more accessibility and simpler access, meaning that, that point came up after the 2000 election in the, the problems in Florida with the butterfly ballot and stuff like that. There, that the paper ballot system is, while well, we've used it for a couple of hundred years probably, um, still prone to error and that you can build um, ballots in a way that influence the people who vote. We have a very famous example in Austria ourselves. There was a um, an election whether to um, become part of Germany like 50, 60 years ago and the yes was a very large circle and the no was a very small circle. So, um, let's see. Of course, there is a downside to this. There's an election in France that was analyzed uh, with interviews with people who are elderly. It's a total chaos. We don't understand anything. And that's not surprising because most um, digital technologies, information communication technologies are built in a way that the elderly really have problems with it. I have come here twice and twice I have had to walk away without voting. It takes too long. Well, that's an, an, a funny problem because potentially this could go mu much faster. Amid big queues in general to vote, people using the electronic machines were forced to wait up to two hours to cast ballots. So, but even more. Researchers at a French university said that trials of two of the three machines used in France showed that four people out of every seven aged over 65 could not get their votes recorded. So of course, this is again a problem that we could potentially fix. We could build machines and make, make it very easy to vote. In response to this, um, um, or seemingly in response to this, an, an Austrian newspaper titled I'm going to subtitle that for you. Humans, not machines, are the problem with e-voting. That's very interesting because um, it says there in the, in the little print that against all um, that is said, uh, electronic voting systems have uh, uh, worked well during the US election. The skepsis still uh, prevails. And this is also reflected in the retiree who says, I just don't, just don't trust these machines. And that's a very interesting point because 
Why do we have to speak of these machines in terms of trust? Why do we have to trust the machines? And that's the fourth point, the loss of transparency and the exposure of the secrecy. Some people trust voting machines or electronic voting. So Dieter Otten, an internet voting expert from Osnabrück, says, in my opinion, the residual risk for manipulation are less than the risks of atomic energy. And what he's talking, of course, uh, what he's talking about, of course, is the crypto system that is in use. We, we can build pretty good uh, crypto systems by now. We can make them open. We can use standard cryptography, and it's pretty safe. We can build voting systems, and um, we know that for quite some time now how to build use cryptography in voting system so that it's temper safe as long as it's a closed system but unfortunately it's not so let's just step to take a step to the side and look out at um, how traditional voting works so number step one the ballot boxes are set up which means they're checked that they are empty and then they are sealed um, then people come in cast their vote fill out the ballot and they do it in secrecy not even the dog may come in and then they put it into the voting box, they drop it. Um, at some time, the polling station closes, the boxes are opened. Uh, ideally, a lot of people are there to witness this, and the votes are counted. And when the votes are counted, somebody calls in the um, central offices and um, um, tells them the results of this polling station. They're collected there, added, and stuff like that. So that's basically how voting works with paper. An interesting thing here is that this process can be watched by human in every step. In every step but one, we have to black that one out because this one is secret and that's by definition secret. So let's just take um, a fictitious organization, the Union of Paranoid Secretaries um, or p Paranoid um, um, uh, uh, till, till Girls or um, cash, cash Operators, something like that. And they just don't believe that, that the votes will be um, clean, that they think there will be manipulation, votes will be fixed and stuff like that. So what, what can they do? They are a lot, we, we have a lot of supermarket cashers. So the, the union of the paranoid supermarket cashers, they just um, organize themselves and each of them goes to one of the polling stations. Goes there in the morning during the setup of the box and they can be there. It's not allowed in some countries and it's allowed in some other countries. It should be allowed because it's one part of transparency because it's possible that everybody watches the setting up of the voting box so that they can make sure that it's not tampered. They can sit there in the polling station all the time. That's, that's even allowed in Austria. They can sit in the corner and watch over the election process that nothing happens that uh, compromises the security of the election. They can stay there when the station closes. Well, not in Austria, but in other countries, in Germany, this is allowed. They can stay there and witness the counting of the votes, the opening of the boxes and the counting of the votes. And if they do that, if this union of paranoid uh, supermarket cashers um, organizes well and each one goes to polling station, then they can call each other in the afternoon and say, at my polling station, nothing that was suspicious happened. happened. Everything is in order. Then at the next day they can look at a newspaper where all the results are listed and um, if it's a good newspaper it lists all the polling stations. They can see if the result of the counting they witnessed is the same as that is um, taken into the uh, whole result. That's a very interesting feature of this process. It's totally transparent for absolute newbies. Now let's look at electronic voting machines. Normally it works like that. Before the election, the voting machines are verified and stored somewhere. That's just outside um, the election day. And hopefully they are guarded well so that once they're verified, nobody gets to tamper with them. The voting machines are activated on voting day and uh, a self-test is run and probably some kind of test election to see whether they work well. Then the voter interact with the machine, to, to vast, to cast their vote, I'm sorry. Um, this self-test, that's very interesting. Normally these self-tests are really something. So you, you see the hard and the software version, you see two checksums of the software and they can be compared to the values on the ID plate on the side of the machine and that's most of what the security test there does. At some point the polling station closes and the election supervisor transmits the results to central offices. The problem here is 
that while you can sit there and watch, you can do nothing as the member of the Union of Paranoid um, Supermarket Caches to verify that this was okay, because the process of accumulating of the votes and transmission to the central is not transparent at all. It may be transparent to some of the people here, um, it could be transparent to a lot more of technical, technically versed people. Like you could do it open source, you could build all kind of stop guards to prevent um, some kind of last minute tempering so that the software that was open source is really on the machine, stuff, stuff like that. But still, only we could verify that. The union of um, paranoid supermarket caches couldn't. So, compared to this one, and you see there is a problem. And the problem is that e voting is a black box system where the mechanism for recording and tabulating the vote are hidden from the voter. And not only from the voter, it's hidden from anybody who wants to watch. This makes public scrutiny impossible and leaves statutory elections open to error and fraud. Error and fraud, not only fraud. The Open Rights Group, they were. Um, uh, observing the uh, May 2007 election in uh, England, I think, and found that um, it wasn't um, going very well. The Open Right Group cannot express confidence in the results for areas observed because you cannot observe. You can just sit there and see how probably a little counter goes upwards on the voting machines, but you have no way of seeing that nothing was tampered with with the votes here. You can believe it. You can trust it. Ah, there's the trust again. We have to trust these machines. And that's an interesting question. Do we have reason to trust these machines? Now, there's a very interesting point that was make, made in a discussion on Slashdot. Um, I, I know that discussions on Slashdot often have things that are not very sensible. But this was an interesting point. The important thing isn't the voting software. It's an effective voting procedure, said Jen Selden. He isn't here per accident, no. So the, the voting procedure that we use now, the paper ballot, relies on the fact that I, or ever, anybody, the member of the union of um, paranoid supermarket caches, can audit the integrity of every step more. It relies on the fact that everybody can audit the integrity of the step because we can do that. We don't have to do it. So because it's possible to audit every step, because there's nothing that is impossible to audit, because there's nothing that is due to the way it happens intransparent, we don't have to do it because everybody could go and do it. And if there's some doubt arising that there is fixing an election, then probably we all would go and do it. <laughs> the result of the fact that with the, the votes, the presidential votes in the US in 2004, this wasn't the case. The electronic voting machines in a couple of states were really um, dubious. We now have rumors. We have rumors that this election was um, uh, staged, that there was manipulation in this election and that the, pr the person who is now president is really not the winner of this election. And these rumors don't go away. You can't make them go away because there's no proof that otherwise, that it was otherwise. You have to, this is really serious. The president of the International Federation of Processing, um, uh, of, uh, the International Federation of Information Processing, the IFIP, the president of the IFIP says that this election was rigged. He believes the election was rigged. So this is really serious. The president of one of the professional organizations of our um, uh, 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 business doesn't believe that the election in the US were, were um, uh, carried out properly. And you can find a number of URLs to, um, to websites that explicitly show, demonstrate, prove whatever, how how the election was rigged uh, uh, in the slides, on, on the notes in the slides. Just to show how hard it is to disprove that. So, what, what is an effective voting procedure? An effective voting procedure makes fraud as hard as possible. And it allows the voter to go into, uh, um, Steve Gibson uh, uh, uses that recently very often, TNO mode, the trust no one mode. So, if I trust no one, I want to verify everything by myself, so I go there and I want to look at everything. Electronic voting machines don't allow a trust no one mode. It allows, me only me, it allows me to verify that somebody else finds that this is okay, but I can't do it. So, just a couple of words on fraud. There are in, in, in e-voting or in voting in general, there are two different, two very distinct types of fraud. 
You have retail fraud and wholesale fraud. Retail fraud means you have to manipulate every vote or you have to manipulate on the level of the individual vote in order to uh, rig the election. Wholesale fraud means there is a way to manipulate the voting system or the system of transmission of the numbers or whatever <clears throat> so that um, you don't have to manipulate uh, every vote. You can just um, uh, let the people vote what, whatever they want and afterwards you can change it. The paper voting system we have with, the, with transparency in place, with the possibility to watch it, is relatively proof against wholesale fraud. And the only way to temper there is retail fraud. Of course, you can go and the people who count the votes count them wrong and place individual votes on the wrong um, uh, stack of, of votes in front of them. But you need, and that's one of the properties of these two types of fraud, you need a lot of people for retail fraud. You need only, ideally, only one person for wholesale fraud. If there is a successful way to wholesale fraud an election, then it's done by one person because the less person, they, uh, the less person do it, the less uh, um, people you have that know about it and the less risk you have of being exposed. And, and that's the point, of course, e-voting opens or reopens the door that we closed with our voting procedures years ago reopens the door decades ago, opens the door for wholesale fraud. Of course, you can rig an election on a systematic level once you have machines that are not transparent. And that has been shown. Okay, so in my opinion, this loss of transparency and the loss of the possibility to witness and verify the vote by just going there is enough to just say, let's forget about e-voting for the moment. Probably we find something in 10 or 20 years that changes this. But at the moment, probably in 50 years, we are a different society and everybody, everybody speaks C-native or some, some language. And we can all verify stuff that's happening. We can watch code in execution, stuff like that. Um, then we can go back and look at that. But at the moment, I think we should just forget it. So for me, or probably I say it that way. We are a relatively old democracy. There are younger democracies than us. Austria, Europe in general, has democracies that are quite old compared to the rest of the world. There are older ones like our neighbor, neighboring Switzerland. But the point is that we have forgot why we learned to trust the election process. It is because the officials in regard to transparency have what in German there's unfortunately no useful um, translation of this term, have a, have a bringschuld, bringschuld, in respect to transparency. It's their job to make the voting process transparent. It's not our, pros, uh, our job to find a way to look into the voting process or to have some way to verify the result afterwards. It's their job to make the voting process as transparent as possible so that there cannot be any manipulation. Um, there is the idea of the, the tower. Oh, oh my God. It, it, um, the, it, there was the idea that you build a prison like a tower and all the cells are perpendicular no, uh, from, from the center. And you have an elevator in the middle that goes up and down. No, you have a, a person sitting in the middle behind a, a mirror. And it can look, uh, this person can look into every cell because it's round. And um, because of this uh, possibility to look into every cell, but the mirror through which the person looks so that the person sitting in the cell cannot see if he or she is being watched. The theory says that this is a very good prison because the people don't do anything because they could be watched. Of course, this is a very, uh, this is not a good prison. It, it rains on fear. It rains on the possibility of being observed all the time. But if we turn it around and say that's what we want from an election, we want an election that is so transparent that nobody has the idea to want to rig it, to want to manipulate it, because somebody could be watching and he could be exposed. Then this is, that's what I call an effective voting procedure. So for me, e-voting at the moment is a no-go. And just to explain in an epilogue why I think that it's such a big topic in the um, 
not only in political circles where I can understand it, but also in security and um, uh, technological adept circles, is something that came to me yesterday. I think that e-voting is a technological temptation. When, when it's one of these problems where we all immediately switch to problem-solving mode when somebody describes it. You say, okay, we have the problem, we want to use machines in an election, but machines are easily tampered with, so what could we do? And all of us easily switch into a problem-solving mode where we say, oh, okay, that's cryptography, and we can use double-blind signatures, blah, blah, stuff like that. And um, forgetting that probably the question was wrong. So the technological problems of secrecy and security in e-voting are hard to solve and challenge, ev challenge every, respect and challenge every respect respectable nerd, including me. But my main concern is, did we ask the right question? Is the problem setting right? Do we solve the right problem? Or do we have to reframe the problem? And I think that is the core question. How could we TNO, how could we trust no one, the voting process? And I think that there is place for technology in doing that. We can find ways of introducing te uh, technology into the voting process in order to make it trust no one proof. But e-voting in the way it is done now is not the way. So it's just a technical temptation, but it's a very dangerous one. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I hope um, you don't kill me now. Oh, very good talk, thank you. Um, if you just could put your pros and cons slide, then I could share with you the experience we had in France for the last president oh. voting, because we had uh, some town using voting machines. And so basically, if we take all the pros, so uh, the one that is next to the place I, um, I live, um, they didn't have a higher voter participation because uh, the process was so screwed that people were giving up. They were queuing for hours and at some point were giving up. So it was not cheaper, obviously. Um, the result didn't come faster because of the process. So uh, they, um, they were supposed to close at 8 p.m. and in fact the last voter came at 9.15. So they took more than one hour late on the schedule. Uh, no error counts, uh, too bad for them, so basically people vote on the machine and then sign a registry. And they had on one third of their um, offices, they had errors between the machine count and the registry count, which is actually bad. Um, simpler access. Um, they were not adapted for disabled people, so a lot of disabled people, especially blind people, couldn't vote. Just simple as this. Um, so, so bad for the accessibility. The, the other problem is in France, when you want to vote, you can have multiple booths to actually cast your vote, one every 1,000 voter, but only one urn to uh, take the votes. And uh, a voting machine is an urn, so you only have one per, uh, per place. So that, that means that everybody has to queue and vote one by one. And every time you have a problem, then you're delaying the whole queue behind you. So, so what you say, it doesn't scale? No, it doesn't scale at all. You, you can have, it's very easy to make a polling station larger for more people. Definitely. But, um, every time someone doesn't, do, can't cope with the, um, with the voting machine, it's delaying, it's delaying the, the whole process. So no more invalid votes. The problem is some people couldn't vote. So they've been assisted by someone which is prohibited by the process. But actually, uh, people could observe assisted votes. So the, the, simply the vote should have been invalidated at that place. And uh, but the new possibilities were just banned from the French legislation point of view. So if you take all the pros here, they were just all invalidated in that simple uh, election process. 
And that's the experience we have. And on top of that, we have other things like no certification for the machines. We have a um, machine with license where they fail at some basic test where they uh, should success and everything like this. And it's very, very worrying in the end. Mm -hmm. so. That's great to hear. I mean, not, but um, <laughs> I think the point is that um, of, I would expect that from any technology used in any context from, from my prior life. Whenever technology is introduced to some new area, you have exactly these problems. But the wishful thinking is that they can be cleaned up. They can be, the technology matures and in a couple of years it works beautifully because we can learn so much from our failures. I think that one thing you said here hadn't occurred to me yet that it doesn't scale the way normal voting does. That's one point that you can't clean up. It doesn't get better. And the other point is that the process won't be more transparent, even if we mature the technology through several generations. Um, one thing that's very interesting you said, um, uh, the, there's a practice in Austria of letting very old people vote. There's a person from the, um, uh, uh, election office going to um, r r retirees homes and helping people to vote there. And as from, from the experience that told by people who have witnessed this, this is a very dubious process because some of them can't read anymore. So you read to them the labels next to the circles where they make their cross. Of course, you can tell them whatever you want. Um, so you, you can anticipate what they vote and you have the, the, the vote made there. No, no, so it, it, that's, that's the one you want to vote and stuff like that. So that's another point where I think that um, technology in a way could help us let people cast their own vo uh, votes in the um, spectrum of possibilities. Okay, paper ballots are quite unusable for people that can't see. But of course I can build this very simple machine where you put in the paper ballot, you can feel the choices you have, you can press a button, and this machine can be so simple that it's transparent, that I can check it, that I can see if I press this button, then the right cross is made and stuff like that. Without any electronics. Yeah, but the, 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 For me, there's another question. It's like voting is a right for everyone. But at the same time, it's a duty. I mean, for the democracy to work, we have to vote. And thus, the authority has to make it so we can vote in yes, proper condition. Yeah. I mean, if a netherly woman or man wants to vote, the authorities has to give them the possibility to do mm -hmm. so. And it's the same for blind people, it's the same for disabled yeah, people, yeah. for everybody. So um, if the accessibility is not there, then the state is not fulfilling its duty to make people vote. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then do it properly is even another question mm -hmm. behind this. So what you're saying is more or less that there's a monopoly and with e-voting it gets abused. Um, what I... What? Because there's only one provider for, for voting, and that's the state. And by doing what the state wants with voting, with the voting procedure, he abuses the... Yeah, but the state is, um, comes out of the voting of people. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so probably there's the wishful thing. No, sorry. No, that's, that's not right. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, and uh, the plan there is to have some sort of paper trail coming from the voting machine so people can uh, check up on their electronically registered vote. Um, I was wondering, what are your ideas on that uh, point? Okay, um, that's one thing that I actually thought that somebody would ask. So that's for me, th th you remember this, this picture with all the things written in about the voting process. So you have the process that is transparent. And what a paper trail does is it takes um, it takes the process that is not uh, auditable, that is not transparent, and creates a parallel second process that you can audit. And the question for me now is, why should I want to do that? Why should I want, I want to make a, an intransparent process and then create a second process that I can verify the first process when my goal in reality is that I want to have 
state deliver on that Bringschuld that they have to make the process transparent in a way so that it can be checked at every step, not afterwards, but during the process. And this is not what happens here. This places, oops, this is like outsourcing, okay? You outsource the, the security and the integrity of the election to the people. You say, okay, let's see if you, if you catch us. That's, that's, that's what happens here. There are other um, arguments against paper trails, like there's a, you have the problem of secrecy. Okay, so the first person votes, leaves the, the, the voting booth, and you go in and check the, the paper trail, and you know what that person voted. If you can do that after every person, so that, there are other arguments, and they have been discussed very long without real results. But I think that the paper trail is really, it poses for me the question why we really want to do e-voting. If we have to find ways to make it verifiable in the exact way that it was before, then why do we do it at all? Just because we want to have the results faster? And this is really a non-reason. There are, there are people much more into this than I and smarter than I who, say, who said that the voting has to happen manually on the evening of the, of the election. And this doesn't happen with a paper trail. In the paper trail it happens when somebody comes along and says, okay, I don't believe you. Then it will be counted and what, what if we find a discre discrepancy here? But that's not the point. The point is, okay, I already made my point. But we can turn that around. We could probably say we make the transparent process and we, we make a second process that is probably not transparent that watches over the transparent process in an additional way. We could think about that. I'm not sure. That was just a, some idea when I made the, the, the images here. I just wanted to add something that doesn't have to do with technology but with politics. Uh, the argument, as you, as you mentioned, is always we need uh, e-voting because then more people do vote. But I think people don't vote because of the politicians and because of the politics they're doing because they think it doesn't make any sense to vote at all. Well, it, it, of course, this is a, this is a, 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 there's a German word. That, uh, I don't even find the German word. This is an argument that tries to lure us away from the real problem, as you see. It's a problem of political culture. We, we have experienced in Austria that when something is really in, uh, at the stake with the votes, then a lot of people go voting. If there is trust and confidence in politics, a lot of people go to the votes. Our, our minister for, for higher education wants to introduce e-voting to the election at, um, at the universities, the students' elections because the participation there is traditionally low, around 30%. And the argument is exactly that we have a higher participation. But the point is that in the recent, I don't know, 30 years, the possibilities to participate, to really participate in the university polit politically have, for the students, have been, um, uh, have decayed, have just been taken away piece by piece. Nobody wants to go voting because they don't have anything to say anymore. You vote some people and they don't, they can't influence anything. They can't participate. Why, why would I want to vote them? So turn that around, make a different political culture and people will go voting again. Um, I have more questions. Uh, sorry, yeah. one sentence. If this was really the, the central argument, I would say pay everybody who goes to the vote 15 euro. You will have an, it's much cheaper than e-voting, and you will have an incredible participation. Really? No, that's not cynic. That's, that's very real. You have my vote for this. <laughs> okay, sorry, I interrupted you. No problem. Um, I, I have more question for the audience, because uh, supposedly it's full of security, IT security experts. Does anybody of you believe that an electronic voting can work at all? And I'd like to hear why. From, what point of From whatever point of view you would like to take on this. I mean, because I think it's generally unfeasible um, as long as you want to have a free and fair uh, election as defined in the initial talk. I like talk. that. <laughs> I like, okay, there are so people. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, well, you put the hand first. Well, when I look at the voting process, I see that 
normal, regular physical voting has its problems too. Yes. I mean, we see votes being fixed in democracies. I'm not speaking about third world or Africa. We see uh, uh, voting booths that are uh, faked, manipulated, uh, identifications that are manipulated. So no, nothing is really uh, uh, foolproof. And uh, we have to accept that in every, any technical mechanism that we will adopt for voting, either physical voting, real, real life voting, or electronic voting, we will have problems, okay? What we have to do is we have to keep it marginal problems, marginal errors, okay? We have to manage the margin of error. Not, we, we can't expect to have a foolproof technology or a foolproof technique or foolproof procedure for anything. Now, I believe uh, that uh, eventually we will come to the point in which we will have what we call trusted computing, in which we will be able to verify that the mechanism is has not been tampered with, that the identification uh, can be verified in a, in a high, uh, with a low margin of error, and uh, eventually we will find ourselves, I'm not, and I'm not speaking about, you know, all kinds of science fiction uh, writers who have uh, uh, conjured uh, universes in which uh, being corporeal is not the only way of being a human, of being uh, eligible to vote, okay? So, we will have a, a different society in 50 years or so, mm -hmm. and I believe that electronic voting uh, will be part of that society. Mm -hmm. So it's all about believing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, I, I think that one thing that I haven't touched upon, and that's a very interesting point, <coughs> is that of course you can build a voting system where the voter can, after the election, verify that his own vote was respected um, correctly. And I think that's wrong. I think that's from the principle of elections wrong. You cast your vote and it's gone. What if I'm an idiot? I go voting and I forget what I vote, or I deliberately forget what I vote, and I'm just I'm a troublemaker. So I can, I want to prove my vote, I can, I'll get there say, no, I didn't vote that. And let's say 50,000 people do that. We can forget about elections that way. So it makes sense to let go of the ballot and have a system that you can trust that it's uh, perfectly respected. And the only, and only way to ensure that it's transparency. I'm a little bit with you in saying that we could come to a stage where we can find technological processes with different technologies that are actually verifiable for everyone. And then I'm with you. But um, I don't see that coming. I don't, deep in me, I don't believe in it. But it could be. I, I, I was wrong before. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that it's something that will happen soon. But, uh, yes. Okay, I'm not saying that it's something that can happen soon, but I think that we shouldn't just let go. We have to continue and to find ways uh, to uh, find verifiable architecture, verifiable uh, computing uh, environment in which we can eventually have secure e-voting. I just have one comment on this. So um, I work in a domain where we produce uh, software that has less than 10 minus 9 probability of mistakes. So that's very low. So from a technical point of view, yes, we can build a trusted machine that makes barely no error. But the problem is in the process and in the scale you give to someone that fraud. Meaning that the paper ballot is, I mean, screwing up a paper ballot from the um, process point of view is very, very hard. What happens in, uh, in Africa is they prevent people from voting, so people don't get voted, or they put a gun on their uh, family and tell them, if, you, if my candidate is not winning, then you, you, your child are dying. And that's not in the process of voting, that's before or after we burn all the thing and we say, blah, we count. So for me, it's that scale that frightens me, like said, someone, one guy can fool everything. And I think that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So it's not a technical question to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. well, while you carry the microphone to him, I think he, he really has a right to say something. Yes, well, there's um, one, two, three uh, hands okay. that are seen. Please make it short in a way, okay? So, if you can. I mean, there are tons of things I could say about this. I, I try to keep it short. First, 
the statement was, well, there are problems with the current paper system as well. Of course, yeah, there is no system that's totally foolproof. That's not what we're talking about here. The point is, and he brought it up in this talk as well, with paper ballots, if you really want to have an influence on a big election that has big influence on the society, you need a conspiracy of many thousand people working together to change votes in a way that makes sense to them, you know, that pays back. This is infeasible. This is totally impossible. You can't do that. You can't start a conspiracy with 50,000 people changing a vote. With electronic systems, regardless how trusted or super cool they are, what kind of chips you put into it, it's all quantum mechanics and we have absolutely no way of seeing, and that's the point here, seeing what it does. And on the other hand, you only need probably one programmer that cooperates with you on changing the system and you have the whole election fixed with one person. So let's say we are voting the next president in France. What is it worth? I would say France, you know, is probably at least 100 billion euros worth. So if you are the president, there are ways to spread money around. That's the amount of money you can spend. You take 1% of it and put it onto the programmer. If he doesn't program, uh, if he doesn't co cooperate, I don't know, you kill his kids or whatever. You know, pressure is being done in, in, uh, in power systems. And then it's gone. So with an electronic voting, you're endangering the whole concept. If you have electronic voting in a democracy, you can just stop being a democracy. That's mm -hmm. the point. Mm -hmm. It's not something we have to think about how we can do it probably. Then it might work. It's just the end. That's my opinion. So that's all I want to say. Okay. There was two more and the break is... Please keep it short. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we should uh, just put one question of common sense. Do we need to change a process with known problems to a process with unknown problems? <laughs> That's a great question, yes. That's very nicely short. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, well, it's getting interesting. Uh, I hope we continue this. Uh, either tonight or tomorrow at the Meta Lab or at the Robo Exotica. I would like to thank Peter Pogatofer for this very nice talk. Thank you.